All right, so let's make a formal introduction for our listener. Uh, good afternoon, Pete. My name is Claudio, and I'm calling you from Washington, D.C., from the students in Fairfax City. We're very humble and grateful that Pete Jones accepted our invitation to our show. Pete, welcome to the show, man. It's good to be here, man. Nice to meet you virtually. Same here, man. <laughs> And uh, man, the last two years have been very difficult with the pandemic, COVID. How how the the COVID affected you, your life, your creativity, your sanity? How are you holding up? Well, it it, it was uh, scary. I mean, for many reasons, but from a, just looking at it from a well, I guess a selfish point of view, from my own point of view, but also from the many musicians that I am friends with and that I follow. Yeah, it was, it was scary times for for a while, at least. I mean, you know, I gig regularly, not just not just the prog stuff. Um, I do gigs in what we call the working men's clubs here, which is you know like the clubs, the old clubs set up for the uh, you know for the industries, the mining industries, steel industries, all that kind of stuff, and and pubs as well. So you know, gigging is literally my job, um, and that, then it was just you know, just gone. And many people are in that situation. Um, so yeah, it was scary. I mean, we, we got some, got, got the grants in the end, but you know, that took a while to get set up. And we were literally, you know, wondering where the next uh, mortgage, in my case, where the next mortgage payment was coming from. Um, so that was, I mean, that was scary. Um, uh, you know, and in my, you know, my case, I mean, I'm, I'm blind, so there's, there's limited jobs I can do anyway, but it's, it wasn't like I could sort of go down, uh, I don't know, Tesco or, or, you know, Safeways and start to, you know, see if I can do some, I couldn't even, you know, I couldn't even do shelf stacking or, or anything really. I, I'm not qualified for anything else either. So, um, yeah, so that was, that was scary, but, um, then, you know, the, um, I had a, I had an album recorded called The Whispering of the World, which was recorded at the beginning of 2020, and yep. it, that was an amazing start to the year for 2020. I I I I've been to Wales twice to record that album. In between that, I did the bite shows with Francis Donnery, so that was a really full on but a lot of fun. Uh, in February, I started rehearsing for Red Bazaar and Tiger Moth Tales with with a view to a few, quite a few gigs we had coming up. Uh, I also did a little uh, four-day tour with uh, Pendragon. I was doing support for them, and it was just amazing. You know, it was a, it was a, I, I always get depressed at the beginning of the new year, but in, in 2020, I was having such a good time. I didn't get I didn't get time to be depressed. It was it was just amazing. And then um, yeah, we literally were just rehearsing with Red Bazaar for um, Subfusion, a festival over here, and we came out of the rehearsal room and got signal back on our phones and stuff and it was um oh no everything is off you know <laughs> so that was that was weird but so i had that album recorded the whispering of the world but it that didn't come out until much later because the guy who mixed it was was ill um not not covid related but he he had a lot of problems that year and that album was just sat there on a on a computer system in wales waiting to be released and or mixed um so yeah rob said to me well you know why don't you it looks like that's not going to happen so why don't you just you know to give yourself something to do um you know work on get, get to work on a, another album um which turned into still alive which was a, a mini mini album that we did and um that was very much based on i mean every it's kind of a thing now you know it, i guess two years you know, two years later, we can still sort of sympathise with it. I wonder how it's going to hold out in the next sort of 10 years or so when people look back at all these albums that were created in lockdown or or, or that reference the pandemic sort of thing. You know, we, you know, like how's that going to hold up in sort of 10 years' time? We don't know. Um, but, yeah, so that was still alive. And that album, in a kind of abstract way, chronicled how I was feeling about uh the 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 lockdowns and, and general state of the world so still alive was very much a sort of positive track about how we can get through this we've got through we've got through things before um you know as, as the human species we always get through um our hard times and um um the spirit of endurance and all that kind of thing but then there was a lot of other stuff on the album about how you know how it 
it takes a long time to get through that. And, and I, you know, I got um, very down at, at various points. Um, and there were tracks, you know, like um, Golden and Lean Into the Madness that really sort of got into that, that feeling that, um, you know, like it's some kind of doomsday approaching and it's very hard to keep your head above the water at times. So the, so yeah, there was stuff like that. I mean, that, that, that got in, into it. And, um, but weirdly, and I've said this to other people, you know, I kind of hate myself for saying it really, because lockdown was a negative experience in, in so many ways, but strangely, you know, I had getting on for sort of 18 months, possibly longer of quality time at home with my, with my wife, which in the previous few years hadn't, there hadn't been so much of that. So that was, that was lovely. You know, um, I also had my first break from gigging and work in, uh, 20, 20 years. So there was no, um, no traveling, no carrying the gear, no carrying equipment up, up the fire escape steps and, uh, you know, having to sort of walk through the smokers to get in and out of the buildings. And there was no, um, you know, sitting backstage waiting for the bingo to stop so you can, so you can go on and getting back home at sort of two o'clock in the morning and all that. Oh, no, there was none of that. And in a way that was lovely. You know, <laughs> it was yeah. nice to, it was nice to have a break. I mean, f f definitely not worth it, you know, really in, in the great, great scheme of things, you know, but it's a, it's a, it's a, but it's a positive this you know that I, I could sort of uh, look to really but um yeah so I did a lot of creative stuff that year um I did still alive I did collaborations with uh, um, John Holden Lee Abraham uh, I was working on the cyan stuff bardic depths um, various other creations uh, Keith Keith from the Far Meadow. We did we did a track together, so I was spending a lot of time in the in the studio um, doing stuff, and that kind of kept my mind off things. And also, it was a great source of support to know that. I mean, in in a way, you know, it was crazy really because every, every, lots of people were in the same boat. Although you know, uh, you know, many people managed to keep their jobs and keep working, but. You know, it, it was a tough time financially for everybody, or a worrying time. Um, but we were, you know, we were putting out um, stuff on Bandcamp, so the behind the music series, uh, various other things, and people were, you know, people were wanting new music and supporting the artists. Uh, and Bandcamp did their bit with their sort of um, no fee Friday or whatever it's called. And yeah, I was actually able to sort of make. A, you know, a half decent living just by doing what I, what I love. So, you know, it started out as a very sort of scary experience, but there were lots of reassuring moments and it was nice to connect with people with the virtual online festivals like, uh, you know, Prog from Home and uh, Fusion Without Boundaries and all that kind of thing. You know, it was nice to, um, to talk to people online and, um, yeah, there was a lot of support for musicians, which was which was lovely to see. And um, you know, it it does sound you know when you say it out loud, you know when there's you know the, when the whole country is coming to a halt and people are dying and all the rest of it, you know, when you start sort of saying, you know, oh, but I can't work and I haven't got a you know it, I, I can't go and do gigs, you know, it sounds it can sound a bit. Um, you know, poor me sort of thing. But it was, you know, it was a real, uh, a real worry you know, for, for me and many of my friends, you know, at, at sort of at the time, but it was great to have that support. And, um, and yeah, I think I did some creative things which people seem to enjoy. And so, you know, there was ups and downs, but, um, you know, we, we all got through it the you know, best way we could, you know. Good for you, man. No, mm -hmm. no very good answer. Uh, where are you born? Let's go back to the beginning. Were you born like in a musical family? How old were you when you perhaps take, began taking piano lessons, guitar lessons? Uh, oh yeah, sorry, it's, it's very warm here. Um, yeah, I was well, I was born in 1980. Um, I 
don't remember exactly when I started playing piano, but I think I would, I would have been about three or four years old. And it just happened as a result of going to, you know, my mum would take me to friends' houses, you know, like they would have a chat and um, talk about adult stuff. And I'd be left sort of twiddling my thumbs. And one of these friends that mum had, uh, I think they had a piano in their house and I just started playing on that and soon realised how the different keys control the different notes and making melodies and stuff. And I just got into it that way. And yeah, I, I had a lot of tuition later on um, to do my exams and my grades and stuff like that. But I was into music for, for, for as far back as I can remember, really. And it's, it, I say this jokingly, but it's, it's the truth. It's the only thing I literally, the only thing I've ever been good at with the possible exception of um, writing lyrics, but uh, that's a that's a second really. And uh, so yeah, I, I got into music um, very young age. Started piano around about sort of eighty three, eighty four, and started playing recorder as all kids do. You know, at one point, you know, we we'll, we all have to play the recorder. Whereas the difference, I think, with most kids, I actually quite like the recorder, and I. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I, I, I played it voluntarily, um, you know, whereas some kids, you know, they, they just have to, they have to do it. And it's, you know, it's a God awful racket. <laughs> we all go through that time, you know? Yeah. Um, so yeah, I did, you know, the usual things, school, school plays. Um, I was writing songs from a quite a early age. Weirdly enough that the songs I was writing back then, Probably, probably out of a complete lack of discipline. Uh, I was writing. I would set the tape recorder running, and um, and I would just do say, uh, you know, I, I would keep the tape running, and I would play on the piano and, and just sing any old lyrics that came to me, which was usually stuff about, um, you know, either me and my sister or or whatever it was I've been watching on the telly the previous night. Um, and I would get to the end of the tape, forty five minutes, and go, oh, that's that's side one done. <laughs> and I would. <laughs> turn the tape over and do the next one. Oh, that's side two. There we go. That's an album, you know, and it would take it. Yeah. I would, you know, just literally over a day, I would just make an album. And of course, most of it was absolute, uh, you know, crap. Um, but it kind of sowed the seeds for the sort of prog stuff, perhaps that I would do later. Um, in as much as they were sort of long form, uh, long story songs, you know, uh, with very free approach to tunes and time signatures. <laughs> Um, so yeah, I, I went on the, the TV on the BB, on the BBC program in 1988 with, with a song I wrote for a competition called Song for Christmas, yeah. um, oh, which, uh, which I, I won the junior final. Um, and this may mean nothing, it may mean nothing to some of your listeners, but, um, funnily enough, Gary Barlow from Take That was actually on that program. Not the same one I was on. I think he was the year before me or maybe two years before me. And he won it as well. So I was in good company there. But um, um, yeah, so then I guess I carried on through school. I was still writing weird stuff um, around sort of age 11 and 12. I was writing stuff like The Isle of Witches, which later I resurrected for Cocoon. So even then I was writing very, very strange stuff. Yeah, Were, were your parents very happy uh, that you won that competition? Was, uh, was it a surprise to them? Or was it a surprise to you? Uh, well, I mean, they, they were, yeah, they were very happy and it was, it was a lot of fun. Um, it, it was kind of a one-off, you know, event really. It, it didn't lead to anything else at, at the time, but, you know, I sort of knew back then that, you know, I wanted to maybe do well, music as a, as, as a career or, you know, I think I had, a, um, you know, something written down when I was a kid on, on some, you know, a little bit of paper that I wrote down, I want, I want to be a pop star or something, which, um, you know, at the time I was into, you know, you know, uh, Phil Collins, Paul McCartney, George Michael, um, uh, lots of eighties bands. So yeah, later on, I started to, um, I think it was when I was in my teenage years, I, I um, when I started to be sort of become aware of girls, you know, and, uh, and I was listening to the stuff that they were listening to and thinking, if I write stuff like what they're listening to, then, you know, 
that will make them, you know, that that will make them be into me, you know. Um, That's right. Well, I got, I got, uh, yeah, I think I got um, sidetracked with that one for quite a long time, and it very rarely worked. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, then I started writing pop stuff and I got into that as well. Um, I was, um, I was, you know, I was in loads of bands later on when I was in my sixth form. I was in, uh, you know, uh, various original bands. I, I started, to, I learned to play guitar when I was sort of 17, 18. I, I taught myself guitar and bass. Um, I was in various bands at school. Um, I left school in 2000, sorry, in uh, 1999, what am I trying to say, 1999, um, um, with the intention of, I, I formed a, a duo with a friend of mine, um, and we were going to have a gap year and make some money playing the clubs, uh, and then maybe go to university. Uh, well, um, fast forward 20, 23 years later, I'm still in the gap year. <laughs> still enjoying it um so yeah we started doing the clubs we did some tv stuff uh me and my friend emma we did um a couple of shows in, in england we did, we did the x factor which i don't tend to talk about that much but we, we we did that um i attempted to uh get my pop career off the ground um with limited success although i did have one album out which is still on spotify which is called look at me now um that was the sort of some achievement of my pop career and around about 2011 um i started to get very disillusioned with the music industry in general because well what i considered pop you know was changing sort of very rapidly um and probably was not going to be what for me, you know, and I was I was I was thirty in my early thirties by then, so it was looking less and less likely. Um, also, you know, the record companies uh, I'd approached various record companies over the years and just had very little success. And I think what I was trying to do was probably too varied. You know, I was told by a famous uh, record producer, El Elliot Kennedy, who listened to my stuff, and he said, "You're doing." like bits of everything you know you need to sort of narrow it down and uh, rightly or wrongly i just couldn't work out how to do that um so yeah i had this great stage of disillusionment i had writer's block for a couple of years and um one day i sat down on my bed with my tape recorder that i still had back then and i thought let's just write something anything you know just got to get the the juices flowing and i picked up the guitar and I, I started writing this song which turned into a visit to Chigwick and um, I had recently discovered bands like Big Big Train and Frost and Haken and Kuiper, Agents of Mercy along with the stuff that uh, Steve Hackett was doing back then and you know I, I've always been into my prog since since I got into Genesis from a very early age. So prog has always been with me. And I thought, well, let's go back to that. Let's let's write a prog album. And it may well be that I just do it for my own enjoyment. It, it may just sit on my laptop and I'll listen to it from time to time and think, you know, that was that was cool. Um, so that's what I did in uh, 20, well, the end of 2012 and into 2013. I started writing the album that became Cocoon. That's right. Yep. And a year after that, uh, well, uh, in the intervening year between 2013 and 2014, I got, I got um, in touch with various people through Facebook. You know, that was just because um, I didn't you know, I didn't know anybody else who liked prog in my circle. And even now, you know, in my local village and in my sort of circle of friends, local friends and people I went to school with, you know, very few of them sort of know what prog is or and, and if they do, you know, they're not really into it. Um, so through Facebook, I sort of got with this other the other crowd, you know, <laughs> of, of proggers. Yeah. And eventually through one of them, um, the album fell into Rob Reed's hands. And he was brilliant. He was prepared to put it out as it was. He didn't want me to sort of go and re-record it or make any alterations. And that was Cocoon. And it all kind of went on from there. You know, the opportunities and 
the uh, the bands I've joined, the opportunities I've had. Yeah. Uh, and a, a career has come out of an album which really I might have just kept on my laptop and never shown to anybody were it not for sort of encouragement from some yeah. of the Facebook crew. So out of out of nothing, you know, very unlikely turn of events as far as I can see, you know, a career of sorts emerged and you know, here I am six years later. Good, good for well, you. Eight years later, I suppose, yeah. Do you remember what was, uh, we will break down your career in a lot of areas and, and mm -hmm. big questions. So do uh, you remember the first gig that you ever got paid or what do you do, how much it was or what do you do with the money, remember? Or? Oh, the first gig, uh, yeah. That was the first, or no? The you? first gig I ever got paid for uh, was New Year's Eve uh, 1998. Uh, in my local, one of the local pubs in the village, um, I got myself some backing tracks. To, I used to make my own tracks in those days. Um, got myself a bunch of tracks together. It's probably pretty awful. Um, approached this pub in the village and, you know, very, very naively, very nervously, you know, asked them if they wanted a... Um, a band uh, or an act for New Year's Eve. And they were like, well, yeah, you know, could do, you know, come and show us what you can do. So I went and played on the piano uh, upstairs in this pub. And they're like, yeah, yeah, we, we, we'll, uh, you know, depends how much you want. And I think I asked for 30 quid, 30 pounds. Yeah. <laughs> and <laughs> for New Year's Eve, New Year's Eve, um, yeah. which is utterly, I mean, by anybody's standards, really, you know, when you... You know the, the the you know the, the cheapest of the sort of pub acts would be asking more more than that. But I was you know I, I didn't dare didn't dare ask. For, it took me enough courage to ask for that. So what did I do with it? I, I, I have no idea. I can't remember. I think I put it towards buying um, a better uh, PA. I think, but that took a took a while. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So let's, yeah, good for you, man. Let, let's go back to your first album. Look at me now. Uh, which I was able to listen to Bad Camp and another another media, and it's a it's a very good album. I mean, it, it at the beginning I suppose that it's difficult for everybody to get it started and then have the courage to put something out there, um, you know, and then eventually you you thought, well, not only I can play piano, play keyboard, or sort of play different instruments, but you begin more confident with vocals. And um, um, you were fronting Barry's band, you know, and many solo performances. So feel free to elaborate on, on, on that. Uh, well, look at me now. It was a, a collection, really. And the other thing back then was I was... Um, I went through a few years of being sort of... Well, I was working. Uh, you know, I left school. It's funny, when, when I was actually at school, I used to do loads and loads of stuff. And even, you know, like um, in the weekends, I would stay late after school to do stuff in their studio. I would I would do stuff in my own studio at home. Uh, I did loads of stuff. And then a weird phenomenon happened when I when I left school and started working uh, for a living doing the, uh, the pubs. I found myself with five days a week with nothing, you know, n n no school, no homework, no timetables. And basically I had an awful lot of time and I wasted it. You know, I, I, I procrastinated an awful lot at first. You know, I didn't know what to do. You know, I thought, well, hey, you know, I'm working for a living. I don't have to get up. I don't, I don't have to go to school anymore. You know, it was very sort of uh, complete change of routine and I think I handled it very badly you know I uh, didn't do much creative stuff at all so eventually I realized you know you've got all this time just you know you need to make the most of it so look at me now was the um, actually um, it took about 10 years for me to to make it because I had a very slow start um, so yeah, and because I always like to tackle these different styles and genres and stuff, that's, that's kind of what it turned into. So, you know, you've got, you've got power ballads, you've got, you know, almost 
rock metal sort of stuff on there. You've got um, sort of acapella boy band type stuff. Um, a bit of country sort of flavor going in. So it's kind of whatever I was listening to at the time ended up sort of going into the to the mix. And maybe that's why it was not so much of a success because it because it did, you know, it was more like a best of really than a, than a, than a, a full album. Um, but yeah, around, you know, throughout that time, um, I, I mean, I started playing guitar very badly, uh, in my last year of school. Um, and then, you know, I, I always wanted to play guitar. It always seemed like a really cool thing to do, but I could never play it properly. I, some people tried to teach me and I couldn't play it, uh, sort of the proper way with your hand around the thing. I, my instinct was always to play it with both hands on the top of the fretboard, like a piano, I suppose. And no, nobody could obviously teach me that really. Um, and so I ended up d doing it myself. And, you know, I still say now, you know, I'm, I'm a keyboard player who, who plays a bit of guitar, you know, <laughs> that's, uh, you know, I mean, I do play guitar live, but if you ever listen to sort of my live guitar playing, there's there's always many mistakes, you know. In the studio, of course, it's brilliant because you can just punch in. And in those um, in, in, intervening years, I um, I think I sort of honed my craft, if you will, as a as, as a producer, because I was doing my own stuff. Uh, I did an awful lot of backing tracks for myself and other people, and that taught me a lot of sort of producing techniques because, you know, I was literally doing stuff from uh, sort of the most recent hits, you know, uh, back in the day, of course, you know, Sugar Babes and, um, you know, Robbie, Robbie Williams, or whoever it was, was, was making hits at the time. You know, I, we, I was reproducing those to the best of my ability, those backing tracks. And then I was doing, uh, you know, opera stuff for some people. I was doing country stuff. I was doing uh, stuff like Rubettes and the F Four Seasons uh, and 70s funk and all all kinds of genres. Um, and that taught me basically how to, um, how just by copying what they'd done and getting it as close as I, as I possibly could, that taught me how to sort of produce and, and get different different sounds. Um, which at the time I didn't really think much about because, you know, it was just doing what I had to do. And sometimes I made some money out of it and sometimes it was just for myself. Um, but I think it's taught me a lot of stuff that I've used later on, um, with my prog stuff. So, so yeah, I, um, I had a, you know, I, in many ways I had a good time, you know, and we had the bit of stuff, a bit of TV success and stuff like that. And, um, you know, um, I think I learnt a lot, um, not necessarily, um, you know, I think sometimes by, by coincidence, but by the time I came to doing the prog stuff, I think I got all of the sort of, I, I, I've learned a lot of, a lot of, uh, tricks and a lot of, um, techniques. And I think I kind of got that, um, the randomness out of my, uh, you know, I, I, I kind of got it all out there. Uh, but of course, when you're doing prog, you know, you, that is the great thing about it. You can sort of, to, you know, obviously people have different boundaries, but you can, if you want to, you can go off and do a, a sort of music, a music hall bit, or you can go off and do a, a, a metal bit in the middle of the song, or you can, you know, there's a lot more freedom. And I think that's kind of what I've mi been missing all those years was to have those boundaries um, taken away a bit, you know, and be able to sort of, stretch out which is what prog has, has provided me and um and so i think all that all that all that experience um kind of went into that yeah uh, yeah and the album you know Bobor is very progressive and uh, i really like the album i am glad that thank you, you that somebody gave you give you a chance uh, to put it out there and uh, yeah, and, yeah, and, well, I'm, and, I, and i'm happy that it didn't stay in your computer because you know well you know a, a lot of people uh, say to me, still say to me, uh, Cocoon, I mean, I like your other stuff, but Cocoon was the best, which makes you think, well, I could have not bothered doing the last six, seven albums, really, that would have saved me. <laughs> you know, yeah. Obviously, I peaked, but um, no, it means a lot that um, you know, people still like it and yeah. no, think no, highly no. of it. Yeah. You, you, gotta, you gotta do 
you, I, I suppose I'm not a musician, right? I'm, a, I'm an engineer by trade, but you got to do what you think is important to you, independent of what people think you should do or not, right? So, oh, you absolutely, know, when, yeah, yeah. You know, if you, if you, if you started as a pop person, pop style person, and then you went, you discovered progressive rock and band like you know Genesis or Peter Gabriel or Camel Sky yeah. and so on. So and you, you, and you say, well, Prague came to my life, and you put an album, but you have done a lot of other stuff, which, which is very good. You know, you shouldn't. Uh, live your life based on the feedback you get from people. Uh, follow your inner voice inside yourself. Yeah, you, yeah. You know, so. Yeah, sure. <laughs> and then, uh, and then after that, you, I, I have a question to you with, for the Tiger Motels, where, feel free to elaborate where, how the name came about. And I saw a lot of concert for concepts such as uh, you know, childhood or season of the year, like spring and winter. Feel free to feel free to elaborate on those. Then why the names and? Uh, yeah, well, um, I think um, I didn't even have a. I, <laughs> I just, yeah, I just remembered that I, originally uh, I was going to call the album a progressive childhood, which I look back on now and think that was an appalling idea but i think somewhere in my head you know when i was thinking about what to call it and about marketing and thinking well if it's got the word progressive in the title that might that might um, do you know it might come up in more searches and i think that was a, a terrible idea thank goodness uh, but i think it was my roadie that came up with the idea of cocoon because he listened to the album and he heard that cocoon is mentioned in the um in the the lyrics of uh, don't let it go feels all right and i think he suggested to call the album cocoon um, and then trying to think of a, a band name or a project name. Um, I think originally I was going to call the band Cocoon as well. Um, just have a, a, an eponymous, uh, is that the right word? Yeah, eponymous um, album name and band name. So um, uh, I think I decided against that. And I was trying to think of things like the Cocoon Collective. Uh, I wanted to be able to expand and have other musicians in, in the project and stuff like that, which I've done to a degree. Um, so yeah, I started thinking of Cocoon, Contingent, the Cocoon, uh, Collaboration, all these things linked with Cocoon. And then that sort of branched off into sort of moth-related <laughs> names. I must, I must have had a hundred names vary, at various points that I've just threw out. I wish I'd kept a list of them. Um, Tiger Moth, uh, I mean, there's a Steve Hackett song called Tiger Moth. Realistically, I don't know how much of that was just a steal from him um, when I knew the song. But I can't remember if I actually took that from him or not. But um, Tiger Moth just was one of the things that came up and, you know, Cocoon, Moth. And, and yeah, and then the Tails bit on the end just seemed to sound, it sounded proggy. I, I sort of mentioned it to various people and they, they liked it. And there comes a point, you know, when you, you know, when you've got that many names, you just have to pick one. And that, that was just how it happened. Um, Cocoon was a, an album mm -hmm. based on um, sort of the, uh, my childhood, because uh, I had a, you know, I had a lovely, lovely childhood. And um, coming to the end of that was a bit of a jerk, you know. Um, you have to sort of wake up and face the real world sort of thing. And uh, that was a bit of a jerk for me. And, uh, and I think for all, probably for all of us at some point. Um, so that was what that album was about. And coming to terms with the loss of childhood and various you know, subjects of imagination, uh, uh, loss and re rebirth and stuff like that. Um, and that's kind of been the, uh, I guess that's been where a lot of my stuff has come from. You know, a lot of my albums like the whispering of the world is is kind of moments from my past and stuff like that and and a lot of nature sort of feelings of that nature and that kind of thing go into the albums um and i think the 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 seasons you know i i, I remember making a list of what i was going to do because once cocoon came out i thought well I've, i need to follow this up um and um I remember making a list, which I don't even know if, if I've still got it, but 
it included stuff like you know just just ideas like uh, do the four seasons. Um, I think at one point I was going to write an album about um, uh, uh, Odysseus or something like that, a Greek legends type thing. I never got round to that, but that's probably been done anyway. Um, the storytellers. Uh, I had a sort of long list of uh, things that I, I thought I could tackle, and uh, I'm still sort of working through that list now, actually. So uh, there's the, the other four, the other, uh, there's two more seasons left to do. Um, um, maybe some more storytellers, I don't know. Uh, I've actually got a, yeah, there's about two or three albums that I still want to, to make, and that's just, well, four, I suppose, because I'm currently working on one now, which is not any of them. So, yeah, so yeah, yeah, lots of lots of inspiration, and it, it it definitely turned on a on a tap that had been turned off for many years. I mean, I did Cocoon in 2013, um, which came out 2014, and then within within a couple of months of 2015, I'd, I'd done Storytellers Part One, and it was just so exciting, you know, to be um, be able to sort of do exactly what I wanted to do. Um, you know, no no idea was too uh, ambitious or ridiculous or whatever. You know, I could just do um, proggy music, and to find that there was a market out there for it, you know, it was um, it was a wonderful time, um, and it's still, you know, it's still uh, I'm still having the creative. Uh, feeling now it's kind of slowed down a bit you know uh, especially with all the other stuff that's going on as, as well now with Red Bazaar and Camel and all that stuff which I guess we'll come to uh, but uh, yeah so there's a, lot, there's a lot more going on now so there's a lot more that needs to be juggled and you know um, the albums have sort of slowed down a little bit but uh, you know I'm still very much you know happy with the way things turned out and glad that people are still enjoying the music. Absolutely, man. So feel free to elaborate. In, in two, 2016, you end up joining Camel. Uh, Camel. Feel free to elaborate how 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 it happened. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, um, again, it all, it all kicked off around the same time. Uh, this was 20, 2015. Um, Storytellers two. Uh, sorry, Storytellers one had come out. Cocoon had come out. Obviously. Um. I'd been, I started doing a few gigs. I did, I supported Magenta. I supported um, Davy O'List from Nice, which was, which was cool. Um, and I had a few things going on. And um, yeah, I got this um, email from a friend of Andy Latimer's, a chap called Barry Lenton, yeah, wow. who kind of, kind of put us together. And he, I forget now whether he recommended Andy. Uh, whether, whether he recommended me to Andy or or whether Andy had already heard of me, I, I kind of forget the exact sequence of events, but Barry was basically saying, do you mind if I introduce you to Andy? Because he wants to talk to you about joining Camel. And uh, oh. to be honest, I, I, you know, totally level with you. I, I'd heard the name of Camel and I think I'd heard a couple of tracks from the I Can See Your House From Here album, uh, but I didn't know much about them at all. You know, I... I my prog knowledge is sketchy, you know, and um, yeah, Pink Floyd, Genesis, yes, King Crimson, you know, those bands I kind of know a fair bit about, but I hadn't really heard of Camel much at all. Uh, so I knew it was big, uh, but I didn't know, you know, I had to think to myself, you know, do I do I know this? Do I like this stuff? Do I want to get into this? You know, um, it's, it's a big commitment to make and all that kind of thing. So Andy got in touch with me. Um, he asked me to send in a version of Ice uh, and to be as um, true to the uh, Kit Watkins parts as, as, as you know, to be true as the, to the original parts as I could be. Uh, which at the time was very easy for me because, like I say, I'd done all this stuff with making backing tracks. So basically, I sort of reproduced it, <laughs> you know, very very truly. Um, I sent that off to him. And um, he got back to me and said, you know, that sounds great. Um, you know, do you want to get together for a rehearsal? So oh. in in February, or was it January? January um, 2016, that would have been then. We got together in a studio in, in Mansfield. They, they came over to me, bless them. 
um, Andy and Colin and Denis, and we all met for the first time. And we just, Andy had given me a set to learn and I, I sort of got it down because I, because I don't like to turn up, you know, I hate rehearsals when, you know, like you, know, you always get at least one, one guy who turns up, not, he's not prepared. He's not learned half the stuff. You know? <laughs> so um, rehearsals are always a bit stressful. So I thought, well, I'm not going to be that guy. I'm going to learn everything. And I, I pretty much did. We went through the whole set, the whole sort of uh, two hour set or whatever long it was. And uh, I think I think they were impressed with that, and so yeah, that was. I, I joined the band for the Japan tour uh, in 2016. We did four dates, and that was you know that was incredible. Yeah. Uh, but it was all kind of over in a, in a bit of a flash, you know, four four dates, and and I, I spent a lot of that time just sitting on stage, going, you know, I've got what's coming next, you know, just hanging on, you know, <laughs> you know, it was all very. Um, new to me um uh, going on a tour of that kind with you know and a, lo a lot of expectations you know i had big shoes to fill so yeah it was um it was a bit daunting um but then of course yeah we got together in 2018 and that kind of sealed it you know for, for all of us i think you know we got a lot closer as a family and i'm going to repeat what colin said in your uh, previous interview but that because we had lots and lots of rehearsal time uh because we were doing quite a big tour and we had must have had about three or four weeks of rehearsal time spaced out over you know um a couple of months and we would uh, rehearse from sort of 10 o'clock till seven o'clock uh with a bit of lunch and you know lunch break so we'd stop for dinner at seven o'clock and that was that was the work day done, and then we would go back to the uh, studio. We would uh, have a little uh, um, uh, uh, drink or something, uh, and then we would um, then we would jam for sort of like two or three hours, and then we would sit there. We would sit back there listening to ourselves, going, "Oh, aren't we great?" You know. <laughs> so we had an amazing time doing that, you know, uh, and I think, you know, inevitably it just sort of gelled us together as a, as a sort of a band and as a, as a family is a bit cliched, but I think, you know, we were a, a, a family unit by then. And then the tour itself where we did um, all the, you know, Japan, Turkey, Israel, all the European dates, and finally the UK dates yeah. uh, by the time, you know, by the time we got sort of, um through the first leg of the tour you know we were we were tight you know we were just just bang on it you know on the money and so by the time we got to do the albert hall gig we were just yeah we were just you know we were really together you know uh and it's one of the proudest achievements of my life and to have it sat there I and mean, my cds are are not in alphabetical order they're kind of in genre order so to have my, you know, to live at the Albert Hall, Camel uh, sat sort of a few CDs down from uh, Genesis Seconds Out or whatever, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> it's, it feels like, you know, it feels like, I mean, obviously it's not, you know, some people say it's not on a, on a par, but for, to, for me, it feels like it is, you know, and it was a, a wonderful time, um, a wonderful experience and so happy that we're doing it again in uh, 2023. That's yeah, right. yeah. You, you know, I think, um, you know, that, that was probably going to happen. I think we were talking about it in 2020, of course, or, or 2021. I think we were going to do it, but then that w w went wrong. And I think, I think they've done the right thing in waiting for 2023 uh, to, um, to, to get the ball rolling for the tour. Although, you know, uh, let's not speak too soon. Who knows what uh, further apocalyptic uh, events are going to take place between now, <laughs> now and next year. But, uh, yeah. you know, let's let's hope you know and i think it's going to be a, it's a, a great time yeah you you i think you will start the tour in spain uh and then um definitely I, i'm going to be there so yeah <laughs> i will be meeting you and colin and mr Vladimir and all the other guys excellent excellent cool so feel free to elaborate i think uh, the, i i heard read some plan of, of um perhaps you and andy Put in a, a a new album. Uh, I think it was in, in some interviews in 2018. You guys talk about that kind of stuff. Doing something else besides 
Kamal, is that is that a true <laughs> statement or is that <laughs> idea that is somewhere? Or? Uh, well, I don't know about I don't know about that. Um, we it's no it's no secret that Andy and I have written a couple of songs together. Well, a, f- a few songs. Um, we actually did um, Mystic Dreams, as we called it, and uh, Dingley Dell. Yeah. On the 2018 tour, and we did those in Japan and Turkey, I think. And I think by the time we got to Israel. And he was really struggling. He had, uh, well, we didn't know it at the time, but he had a hernia uh, coming on. And then, you know, he was really struggling um, and we had to cut the set down a bit. So we dropped the new songs. But um, yeah, so we we have written new songs together. Um, and over the years, we've kind of added to that. But um, there's there's no firm plans for anything, you know, album wise that's not to say i mean you know i'm answering the way andy would answer you know he's he's written you know so many um albums worth of material that since uh, a nod and a wink that just haven't come to anything but um we we definitely would like to uh put out an album it's just a, it's just a matter of getting it together and working out what direction we're going in and basically things coming together really so i mean i'm not I'm not ruling it out, but there aren't any firm plans at the moment. Yeah. Uh, so yes, yeah, it's, it's um it's an ongoing uh, <laughs> it's an ongoing question. Yeah. <laughs> I got you with the with the new uh, upcoming tour with with Camel, and I assume that it will happen. You know, and um, kind of Andy goes away, and then come back like a, I don't know if the tour will start in April, like February. Okay, let's rehearse, and then you guys do you know, the fan want to listen, you know, the hits, but Andy bring new material, or you guys bring new material, Colin may be working something else, or it's pretty much driven by, okay, Andy say, well, okay, we want to play the following 15 track in the following order, or, and this is it, or you guys can bring yourself together from what you have done since. Uh, we, we, um, I mean, it, it will, it will all be um, Camel, Yes. songs i should imagine we, we you know andy has asked us for you know our input what we'd like to do and um i think we've all come up with suggestions um uh, in my case some very silly suggestions like um down on the farm and um, remote romance which i think we, we would be a lot of fun to do but uh, i'm not sure if that'll come off but no we, we've all sort of put our suggestions in um it's it's ultimately down to to Andy, you know, to sort of make the final decision. But I think, you know, it, it's taking into account what we what we think and, and and basically what works, you know, when we get round to doing it in the in the rehearsals. Yeah. I mean, we're well. I don't know when what when we're rehearsing yet. We're, we're, that's not been scheduled just yet. But we will get together and we'll do. I mean, if it's anything like the last tour, we we did. We had a sort of. I think we had about a three hour, three and a half hour set of worth of stuff that we were rehearsing. And I, I mean, I knew it already because I'd timed, I, I timed it already. I was thinking this is way too long, but we sort of rehearsed it up and got it, you know, just so we've got enough to choose from, you know, we can choose what works and what doesn't work. And then we sort of got through it all and we played it through one day from start to finish. And, uh, you know, Colin was like, right, that's, that's an hour too long guys. I'm like, yeah, I thought it was. <laughs> so, we, so we had to drop a load of stuff. So I think, you know, it's just, just a matter of working out what works. Um, whether there'll be any new songs in there, literally, you know, for me and Andy or if the other guys, I, I don't know if there'll be any new songs in there is a short answer, but uh, it's called 50 Years Strong, uh, the tour. So yeah. uh, I think... You know, there obviously there'll be, a, I think, a, a fairly well repre- represented um, arc of the of the canon. You know, and uh, you know we might we might decide to concentrate more on a particular album. You know, lots of people were asking about Stationary Traveller on the last tour, but then lots of people were asking about um, Dust and Dreams. You know, and um, 
and then other people want you to go back to the you know camel and mirage days and you know concentrate on that so it's a lot of uh, pr parameters and a lot of, sort of criteria to try and please uh, as many people as you can so i mean i don't know what the set is yet but i think i think you know it'll be fairly representative of uh, camel and we you know you never know we might we might get a new song in there but i'm not um, you know i'm not holding I'm not committing to anything and, sure, and I'm not, sure. I don't need to hold your breath. So, so yeah, you. we'll, we'll have to see what happens. Yeah. I, I always <laughs> thought, I always imagine how rehearsal are and see, let me, let me explain myself. So mm -hmm. I'm, I go in, I, I'm very lucky that where I live, I'm able to see, I don't know, 40 shows a year or so, if no more. Wow. Uh, but, you know, and I have a view, a big music collection of about, I don't know, seven, eight thousand between vinyl and CD. So I, I listen to a lot of music, but I'm, I'm a consumer, you guys. You know, I go to a show, the equipment is there, the show is done at A, I got at 7.30, I got a beer and enjoy myself and I go home, right? Now yeah. I want to start thinking in my head, well, I want to learn how this stuff happened, right? So... Uh, I'm going, I'm in the process, I'm going to be interviewing different um, people that, you know, put a stage together, uh, do the rehearsal stuff, go back the scene, start how, how really happened, you know, yeah. and uh, I would love to one day go to either with Camel or, and I talked to Steve Hagen about doing that, go kind of behind the scene and then do go to rehearsal if they if I'm allowed to you know, record 15 minutes one day, 15 minutes there for you guys, not for me. And uh, mm -hmm. to see how all this stuff came together from an idea, rehearsal, pre-production, okay, go on stage. You know, uh, I would love to now go behind the scene and and for my own gratification, yeah. learn how this stuff happened. It will be beautiful to do that. Well, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, you know, uh, some bands kind of deal well with that, don't they? You know, they'll, like, they'll make it, you know, they yeah. make videos of what goes on and the, you see the songs growing and stuff like that. And, and other bands, uh, I mean, I'm quite uh, sort of private in that aspect when I, you know, when I'm recording or whatever, you know, I, I like to be, I don't like people to hear it until it's done. And so, you know, different bands have different approaches to that sort of thing. And um you know, for I mean, for Camel, you know, one of the cool things that we did um, that came out of these jam sessions was was tracks like uh, Rajas and End of the Line, and to an extent, uh, you know, Mother Road and and stuff like that. That that um, we started doing these sort of weird and wacky versions uh, of the songs. Um, just to do something different really uh, and those sort of slightly different arrangements came out of that um you know just experimenting around with it and so you know that that's one thing that can come out of rehearsals like that yeah. and we, we we want to do a bit more of that i think this this year so that's kind of what we're going to look at and see if we can just sort of put a new bring a new light or put a new slant on on a on a certain track or whatever and see if we can make it into something slightly different. I mean, what <laughs> one of the great things about uh, going on tour for me uh, with Camel, um, you know, like I say, you know, when my normal, normal gigs, my sort of club gigs, which is what I pay the mortgage with largely for the last 20 years. You know, I mentioned earlier, you know, the travel, the sort of carrying the gear through the buildings, trying, trying not to bump into everybody and, you know, going up and down the fire escapes or, or, um, all that kind of thing, you know, trying to set, you know, trying to get changed in a, in a, uh, a room that's full of step ladders and, and crap that's just been left there. You know, you can't even find the, the hook to put your clothes on all that's that right. stuff. Yeah. Um, well, of course, you know, with camels, all a very different, um, set up, you know, um, you know, I would literally, well, we would travel in, in, fairly fairly good style on the on the tour bus or whatever it was and we would sort of just kick back and uh, sign a few posters and uh, chill out and just have a laugh or whatever it was and then sort of half past four or whatever time it was you know right guys you know stage for sound check and you'd walk on stage my keyboards 
there, the top keyboard's there, it's all, the mic's ready. I just sit down and, and, <laughs> and sound check. And of course, once we finish the show, you know, we, we get off stage and bugger off and, and we go to the next place and it's all, you know, it's all done by, by magic. Although, of course, you know, of course, Andy's, um, Andy's paying for it, of course. <laughs> so that is a, you know, a big uh, change of gear uh, when you're doing a tour like that, uh, as opposed to sort of the, the average musician who's, who's playing in the pubs. But it, which is great until you come off the tour and then, you know, one, one week I was in the Albert Hall uh, and then the following week I was playing in, uh, I don't know, um, uh, Nottingham, uh, you know, the local social club and I'm back, back down to earth again with a, with a bump, you know. But it, <laughs> it, keeps, right, yeah. it keeps your feet on the ground, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. No, and these are very nice. I never, I never, I... I never actually met Andy Latimer, and hopefully uh, one day I will have the opportunity to talk to him uh, as well. You know, he's a very gifted, genius guy, and um, he's, I, he's, I hear he's, he's a very guy. reserved. He's very reserved. He doesn't give too many interviews. So hopefully, hopefully he won't. Yeah, he will I, listen to this stuff with you know calling with you and so on. I will have yeah. the opportunity to interview him. So, I mean, Andy's a lovely guy. Uh, you know, absolutely lovely guy. You know, he's someone I'm you know, very fond and uh, privileged to to call a friend. You know. I think uh, with Andy, you know, if he, and then the, the sort of the reality of it is, you know, that he, for, you know, for various reasons, he's had, you know, health problems yeah. and all, a lot, a lot of stuff to cope with in the last uh, 20 years or so. And I think, you know, because there isn't any, because there isn't anything to sort of, there's no new album yet to talk about. I think when he, so the, the more he, he, when he does interviews these days, he finds it, a bit hard to come up with anything new to say, you know, because <laughs> there's, there's not much new to talk about. But but I think, you know, next year when, when there's a tour on the way, you know, it, it, I mean, he, he's um, well, the same as the rest of us, you know, he, he's, you know, very much longing to get back out on the road again. And I think, you know, we're going to have a good time and uh, hopefully do some great shows and, uh, yeah, looking forward to, to doing it. Sure, absolutely, absolutely. Hopefully, as I say, I will have the opportunity to talk to him. You recently played a new version of Cyan, excellent album uh, for Kin and Country. And uh, feel free to elaborate on that as well, how, how that came together and what was the motivation? Yeah, well, it's getting a bit confusing, really. I, I mean, I'm in, um, let me count them off. We've got Tiger Moth Tales, Red Bazaar, um, Camel, Francis Donnery, um, Body depths, yeah. I've got all these these bands that I'm sort of in. Thank goodness we don't all tour. Uh, that would be that would be crazy if we, <laughs> we don't. Some of the, some of these are just studio bands, but but yeah, Cyan. Um, yeah, uh, I knew about Cyan a few years ago, uh, and it was actually I think it was Chris Jones um, who. I mean, some of the listeners may know Chris. He's kind of Rob's best mate and and uh, more and more these days kind of rob's right hand man you know <laughs> he does an awful lot for helping out magenta and white knight and stuff like that um and chris me and chris were chatting um i think as far back as 2015 and he was sort of saying you know it'd be great to get you to sing on the cyan stuff and i was like what's what's cyan and he, he sort of sent me some of the stuff uh, cyan was the first um, created, I think, I forget the exact year, I think it was 95 or 96, something like that. And it was basically Rob with a, with a sort of, um, you know, an eight track and a sort of MIDI system. Um, and Rob did everything. He did the, the keyboards, the guitars, you know, he's a very young lad at that time. Um, and then that, that progressed as Rob got more into, into more well-known and was able to get sort of better equipment. And, and he, he made, I think uh, two more Cyan albums, um, and then Magenta came along, and the rest is history. And Rob Reed has been involved in countless things since then. You know, it's just an amazing, amazing career arc he's had. Uh, but he decided he wanted to resurrect the Cyan stuff, um, and he started work on it about um, ten years ago. I think he got um, a new got a drummer in to do all the parts, and he re-recorded everything with sort of you know, really good orchestral sounds and, uh, you know, all the, all the equipment that Rob uses now, you know. And, um, yeah, I think it was 2018 when he actually 
got around to asking me if I would sing on, on the new version. So, yeah, somewhere around 2018, I think I started, or 2019, I think I started putting the vocals together for, for Cyan. Um, and, you know, the minute I heard them, I thought these are just amazing songs, you know, really good songs. You know, there's some, uh, there's definitely a hint of, you know, of youth in there. You can tell from the lyrics that Rob sort of wrote these songs, you know, for kind of very, a young, maybe idealistic age, perhaps a bit of naivety in there in, in the nicest possible way. But at the same time, that kind of provides a youthful sort of exuberance and an innocence to it, which makes it sound kind of young and fresh, which is amazing, really, because, you know, obviously Rob is, you know, we're both, neither of us are spring, spring chickens as such, but it's nice to be part of a, a, an album that kind of provides that, that sense of youthful excitement. So I got my vocals on there. Um, Rob then got um, Dan, um, Dan Nelson to put his bass on there and um, got vocals from Ang Harad Brin, which was just beautiful. And then Luke, guitar, Luke Machin, a uh, good mate of mine, his guitar was on there. And the more stuff went on, the, the, the better and better it got. You know, it just kept uh, building. And I thought, this is, this is great. You know, this is going to be a brilliant album. And um, yeah, again, it was all going swimmingly until... Um, <laughs> well, until COVID came along, because we had, uh, you know, gigs scheduled and stuff like that. And we, we got, you know, we had plans for what we were going to do in 2020. Um, th that got held back because uh, we were going to play Summer's End and that didn't happen. And then we were going to play Winter's End and that didn't happen. And on it went till we finally released the album um, last year. And um, yeah, it's had some great feedback. Um really good uh you know good vibes and everything um i think you know i think it's a, a fantastic record and with the you know we've to date we've only managed to do one gig with it because they kept getting cancelled because of covid related reasons but we are playing um summer's end again this year in the uk and, I, and and we're working on the second album, which I've done most of my parts for. I think they've just I've just got a few little bits here and there to do. Um, so the other guys are sort of getting their parts done. And I think you know, obviously, it, it, again, this is uh, I mean, the, for King and Country, it was a resurrection of the original for King and Country back in the nineties, and this new album is again, it's re-recording what was already done. So. So you're seeing the um, the creative um, uh, arc of Rob Reed from from back then, but with the benefit of a few years' experience and um, and the improvement of recording techniques and Rob's uh, Rob's technical uh, production abilities. So you're seeing that. Uh, go side by side. So the, I think the new album is going to be uh, even greater, and. I, can't wait to see what people think of that. And we haven't really set anything in motion yet, but because I'm touring with Camel next year and until probably, uh, it, well, the middle of June, I think, unless there's any more dates that get added. Uh, so I think ideally, perhaps we will look at uh, doing some Cyan shows next year, maybe towards uh, the later part of the year. And uh, you know that'll be that'll, that'll be cool if we can if we can do that. And um, it's great working with Rob and Luke and Dan and, and Jiffy. And you know it's a, it's a great band. It works very well in a live setting. And I think um, you know we're looking forward to getting out and showing showing people that. Yeah, absolutely. Feel free mm. to elaborate on on Red Bazaar and the very soon new album in Perfect Reality. <laughs> yes, uh, Red Bazaar. Well, I. I Joined Red Bazaar in, well, uh, I started working with Red Bazaar in 2014, actually. Um, and for those who don't know, um, Red Bazaar were going a long time before then, but they were an instrumental band and uh, they wanted to try working with a lyricist. And at the time, Gary Marsh was in uh, Red Bazaar, who uh, later went on to work with Grace and Fire and, uh, you know, it's great fantastic keyboard player 
he uh, sort of got us together. And um, yes, yeah, so I wrote some lyrics for Red Bazaar that turned into the first album, Tales from the Bookcase, that came out in 2016. And Red Bazaar have since become the Tiger Moth Tales live band as well. So we do double headers where it's Red Bazaar and Tiger Moth Tales, uh, which is exactly the same band lineup, but two completely different bands. So that gets uh, <laughs> uh, fairly confusing, but not out of the ordinary, I guess, in the prog world where you've got uh, you know an awful lot of people in different bands, you know, or sometimes in the same bands. So. Yeah, uh, Red Bazaar, the new album, Inverted Reality, coming out at uh, the beginning, I'm sorry, uh, no, the end of September? End of September, that's right, September the 30th. Um, and it's um, it's heavier, it's darker, it's a bit more, scree there's a bit more screaming going on. And uh, I think, um, certainly lyrically, I think it's a uh, sort it's, it's of... Um, you know, it's a bit heavier and a bit, um, like I say, a bit more rocking going on. But musically, I think it's kind of getting back a bit more to to their to their roots before before I joined. So it's kind of a uh, a combination of, of those things. But yeah, we're look, looking forward to that. Um, it's been great working with the lads, you know, uh, in Red Bazaar and Tiger Moth Tales. They, um, you know, it's a lot to ask of a band to, uh, you know, if you're not all kind of equal contrib contributors, you know, because Tiger Moth Tales is my, is my thing, you know, uh, in the studio, it's all, it's pretty much me. Uh, and in terms of the writing, it's all me. Uh, so to get, you know, three other chaps to sort of get into that and to reproduce that live and, you know, to give as much as they have done, you know, it's been fantastic. So. For Red Bazaar and Tiger Moth Tales, it's been great working with those guys, uh, Mick and Andy and Paul. And uh, yeah, so the Red Bazaar album is coming up soon. And um, yeah, we're hoping it's been a bit of a slow, slow thing for Red Bazaar. We've not been able to put as much stuff out as um, we'd have liked. And I think uh, you know the, lo the lockdown contributed a bit to that. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's coming out soon, and uh, yeah, we, we we think we've done a, a pretty good job with it. So we're hoping that people are going to like it and um, a bit more, a bit more rocking out. And um, yeah, it should be a good thing. Good, good for you. A, a couple, a couple of personal questions, if you, if you don't mind. Sure. Um, you know, came music. I don't know how to say, but music came to you early in life. You know, over time, perhaps you you lost the sight a little bit of that and or before that and it would have been very easy for you to give it up on your music career and you say well uh, i cannot see it would be hard for me to learn instrument or this or that or but you didn't and that it can it brings you know a lot of motivation tenacity willpower to say well god send me into this world this way and I love music and I will do whatever I need to do to make it happen. And now 40 years later, you are still rocking and you are part of the, one of the best band in the whole world, you know? Uh, so feel free to elaborate what your, your inner motivation came from, or I don't know where music came from to begin with. I mean, I'm a listener and stuff, right? I don't yeah. really into it. Feel free to elaborate on that. Yeah. I mean, uh, as far as this sort of the being blind thing goes, I mean, I, I went blind from a very early age. I don't actually remember it really. Um, I don't remember being able to see. Oh, I could, I could see till I was 15 months old, and I, yeah. and I went. I, I had a sort of eye eye cancer sort of thing, and had to have my eyes uh, removed. <laughs> so um, I don't remember a lot of that really. But I, I think um, music was something I, I clung on to. And so it's really hard for me to, to tell what would have happened, you know, what could have happened, you know, in a different situation. You know, if I'd been able to see, um, you know, maybe I would have been taking more interest in sports or, or whatever, you know, or maybe I would have been into totally different things, but it's hard for me. You, you can't sort of go back and, and um, you know, you, you can't do those, you can't do that experiment. So uh, all I, all I know is, like I say, music's been the only thing I've ever been any good at, and it's always been so 
uh, exciting to me. It, it, I mean, it started off with the uh, very earliest moments of, you know, kids, kids TV um, shows, uh, you know, the music that they would use. Um, I've got, you know, when I was a kid, I had tapes, uh, cassettes of things like uh, Play School and, <laughs> you know, all the, all the kids' programmes of the time and uh, things like Trumpton and Camboy Green, which inspired Chigwick all those years later. Um, so, you know, started off with that and then listening to music in my in my parents' car, you know, we, we'd have the compilation albums on and and then it's later being aware of what was happening in the charts and then getting into bands like Genesis, uh, I mean, Be the Beatles, Queen and Genesis, they are my, they're my bands, you know, they're, they're the yeah. absolute um, perfect trilogy of bands, you know, um, getting into all that. And, and, you know, even now, I mean, I'm, I do, a, like yourself, you know, I do a prog radio show um, and it is possible to, uh, you know, you're, you're listening to literally, you know, you know, maybe I think 2019. I remember thinking I've listened to some 60 or 70 album new albums this year. Uh, you know, and that's just that wasn't even. You know, there was more. There was lot loads more than that. Obviously, that was just scratching the surface. And you know, it is possible uh, very easily to, in fact, to get you know to the point where you, you, you're jaded and you think, oh God, listen, I've listened to so much stuff. I don't listen to my brain can't take any more, or or this sounds like something else, or it's all been done. It's possible. To think that but even now you know uh, there are gems of new albums coming out and so much old stuff waiting to be uh, discovered that you know that i've never heard before so the music is you know immensely exciting to me it's 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 all those things that people say you know it's healing it's um it's uh, you know brings you joy it can tie in with whatever emotion you're going through at the time you know it's it's a wonderful thing and i'm just glad you know blind or not I, and like I say I don't know I can't I can't go back and uh, relive those those times but um, whatever it is you know I'm glad that I've got this gift and that I'm able to use it and and um, you know the opportunities yeah. it's given me yeah no absolutely man we mm. we I personally I take for granted so many things and and the world is so difficult for so many people and um, I'm very fortunate that being able to make a good living, have a study here in the United States, and uh, music has given me so much satisfaction. As, as mm -hmm. I mentioned before, I don't play any instrument. I don't know how to read music at all, but I've been listening to music for 50 years, three hours a day or so. Uh, it's, it's magic. I, I don't know. I put my headphone, I drink a beer or two on a Friday, Saturday, I listen to my stuff, and uh, it's it, it, it's a beautiful thing. I mean, I, I I wish that, you know, we live in the crazy world with the war right now in Ukraine with Putin. I wish I wish I could send Putin some sky record or cable records and Genesis or Tangerine Dream to him for him to listen to stuff and forget about the world, you know. Still, this is yeah. a, a beautiful place where we live in and it's, it's so difficult for so many people, you know. So, well, I... You know, I remember going to see Genesis uh, in uh, 2007 and I'd never seen them before. I'd never been to a Genesis concert. It was all too late by the time I was a fan, you know. Um, my parents, they weren't really keen on live concerts when, say, when Genesis were doing The Way We Walk, you know, it just wouldn't have occurred to us to go to a live concert then. And so I, the first time I got to see them was 2007. And I remember, you know, we were sat there and um, and I... Um, you know, the carpet crawlers heed their callers, and then they're singing that. And I could feel that there was somebody next to me that got with their arm around me. I got my arm around the person behind me. Uh, there was you, somebody coming up front like that was holding my hand up, and I, it was like we were linked together, like the row, right. the, the row ahead, the row behind, the row in front. We were all sort of all these arms were just coming out and grabbing each other, and, and I thought. We could we could solve the world's problems here with this, you know. <laughs> but um, you know, it it is it it is a, whether it be. I mean, music, you know, is um, maybe it can heal um, 
the world's problems maybe one of these days but it, but if not you know it's a it's a great way to escape from them you know <laughs> and that's that's what i you know that's what i do and you know if i mean i wouldn't i wouldn't tempt fate here but you know if there ever came a, a, a time and you say you know you say you don't write music and you don't play any instruments well you know for me if there came a time when i couldn't play instruments or write music anymore uh, you know that, yeah that would be that would be uh, weird and uh, very difficult uh, but you know there is enough music in the world you know that you'll never you'll never catch up with it and that's the exciting thing you know you can you can never listen to all of it you know there's always something you haven't listened to and something yeah. that's wait, waiting for you to discover it absolutely man Being, mm. your journey has been like a good bottle of wine people would say you're very you're getting better and better you know over time and more refined and playing with all this band man it's you have you have like an inner motivation uh, 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 you know, being willing to do a lot of stuff and not giving up. Well, I, I, you know, I'm you make, have, very young. You have a long way to go, man. So I'm making up for lost time because I told you, you know, I told you how much time I wasted when I left school. You know, I, I just thought well, I don't have to go to school anymore, so I can just I can sit on my uh, on my backside and do nothing because because I because I can. You know, I wasted a lot of time with that. So I'm making up for lost time. I, I have a work ethic now. Uh, yeah. I've done. You know, I've I'm got. I'm just starting work on the next. Tiger Moth Tales album, which will be the uh, let me count that will be the, the eighth, yeah, the eighth album uh, since 2014. So that's not that's not bad. Uh, I've done three or four Red Bazaar albums actually, uh, in, including uh, Connections, and then uh, obviously Cyan Body. All all these things, you know, I'm trying to catch up on lost time and, and and make as much music as I can and get involved in as much as I can. And uh, obviously that has its downsides because you have to kind of prioritize and then sometimes it gets on top of you and, and you end up sort of having a bit of a, not a breakdown, but you know, you, you do have to stop and take a step back sometimes. But, but no, I'm, I'm, you know, I found what I want to do. Um, I found an audience that wants to hear it more, you know, that's, that's the important thing. Um, and it's, you know, it's, it's great time. Uh, I mean, whatever else is happening in the world, you know, musically, it's a great time to be alive. So, uh, you know, the, the, the internet provides, you know, people say, you know, pop music is, is is worse now than it's ever been and all this stuff. And you can argue about that till you, I mean, I can, I can say I agree with some of that and I disagree with other things or whatever. You can argue about that all you like. Um, and the obviously commercial stations aren't going to bring you the uh, the depth and the imagination that you're looking for, but that's what the internet is here for. You know, we can we can Absolutely. find all, all this amazing music, and we can spend days and years going down rabbit holes of, of stuff. So, uh, yeah, so musically, I think it's a good time to be alive. Yeah, you know, you from the, the time you were I don't know three or four when you you mentioned that you were doing, you know, bringing on the the record tape and, and then record this stuff to now that many albums later you have travel with Camo in, in Japan and, and many other European countries that I don't know like 20 or 20 albums you have done you have collaborated with many people so <laughs> you're, you're doing you're doing good man you're doing you're amazing good good for you man good good that you didn't give up and uh, and uh, you have the motivation and uh, to do stuff which is which is a beautiful quality to have in a human being. You're plus you're you're a very good person. You're very funny too and uh, you get married <laughs> recently, you know. So you're oh, you're living the good life and playing cheers, with man. Gamma, you know. <laughs> oh, nice one. I need to I need to I need to buy you dinner when I when I see you uh, well a question I will see you before Camo. Do you know that made me laugh. Um just a, I heard uh, Colin when Colin Bass was talking about um yeah. Lorelei. Oh uh, right. Uh, yeah. And he said I, I did I did it with um um, when so and so was in the band, and I, and I think we did it with Pete. I can't remember. I'm like, yes, we did do it. We did do it with, with me, Colin. <laughs> and he said, he said, I can't remember. But weirdly yeah. enough, um, it's it's funny because I I do remember doing Lorelei, uh, kind of. But what I think uh, Colin might have been getting at is that obviously when you if you do a long tour like that one, sometimes you can sort of yeah. Literally, sometimes when you literally get off a bus, go into a venue, do a gig, and then get back on the bus and go somewhere else, 
Yeah. It, it, it's a great gig, but you're not exactly getting a, a sort of template or an idea of the of the surroundings and, and the, the and the place you're in. You know, so it's not. Yeah. Sometimes it rolls into one. You know, and what I what I remember most, sadly, I mean, Lorelai, as far as I remember, it was a great gig and a great audience. But what I remember most about it. Uh, was being sat in a hotel uh, with Ant in this lovely little hotel that we were in. Um, and I don't know where the rest of the lads had gone. I think they went to watch uh, some of the festival or something. But Andy was a bit tired, so he stayed back at the hotel. And so did I. And, and the thing I remember about Lorelei was having an amazing Wiener schnitzel um, at, <laughs> with Andy. And that, that, that was... That's my biggest memory of Lorelei. So, to anyone, anyone from you know from Lorelei uh, uh, listening, I'm sorry about that, but um, <laughs> but yeah, that, that was that was some great schnitzel. <laughs> yeah, absolutely good for you. Well, it was uh, it was very nice talking to you, Pete. I'm quite sure we'll get together soon, and I, I would like to meet you. You know, I go to the in England for work as well often, so hopefully we'll get together, and uh, hopefully the, you know the camel too will happen. Uh, next next year in 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 Spain, start in Spain in May, I think in April or May, uh, next year, and then hopefully we'll meet you. And then I would like to take you to dinner with with uh, Andy as well and Colin and so forth. And for me, it had been an unbelievable opportunity to talk to you and all the people that I have interviewed. And uh, you know, I never thought that would have been possible. I, did, I did remember I, I talking to Steve Hackett at the beginning, my first interview with Steve, and I said, Steve, my, 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 this is what I want to do. For me, I want to promote your music. I want to create a channel where people can create like a musical legacy of all the, all the great musicians out there. And, uh, you know, not many people listen to the right at the time. Uh, but my radio is always going to be free and pay music right to three organization. They are 24 hour a day. Uh, no social media, no advertising, nothing. So well, if you like music, you like interview, you are in Tokyo, you are in Buenos Aires, you're in Mexico, you can, you know, go to YouTube and, and turn the radio and listen to great music, great interview. So, uh, and now almost two years later, you know, I have done over 200 interviews and I have getting a lot of traction with the channel and uh, I've interviewed with a lot of, you know, great names like yourself and Kamala and Sky and Alan Parsons and Rick Wave and all the big names that are coming up. And I'm, I'm very, very grateful. You don't know, as I said before, I, I don't play any instrument. I don't know how to read music. I've been enjoying music, but it has been uh, like, a, you know, a, a great satisfaction for me to be able to talk to you. But you're a great guy, man. And you do well. Okay. Well, cheers, Claudio. It's, it's yeah, great to talk to you as well. I mean, I, I'll just say I looked at your channel um, and yep. uh, you know the, the interviews you've got there. It's it's amazing to be sharing a, a platform with uh, <laughs> some of the greats. You know, Steve Hackett. You know, great inspiration to me and, and Genesis, obviously, of course. Um, and it's you know great to see the work you're doing, mate. And you know, you, you've <laughs> you've really done a lot of stuff. Thank and you. Um, and uh, you know, it's it's great to see the enthusiasm out there um, and and promoting the music and stuff and uh, you know it's it's a two-way street you know we we you know we, we we can't you know without people like you know you know we we can make we can make the music but without guys like you that just want to talk about it and want to buy it and want to sort of show the love for it then you know there's, there's not much point making it you know so it's absolutely you know, it works yeah. it works both ways and you know prog radio is a, is a great thing for that reason you know and um, yeah it's, it's great great stuff mate and lovely to talk to you as well Thank you very much. Have a great afternoon. Pete, say hello to your wife and we'll get together soon, man. For, for sure. Shall, shall, sure I, a couple of shall I shall I just do a um, um a band camp plug before we go? Uh, uh yeah, go, go. <laughs> feel free to feel free to mention your your band camp. I forgot. Ah. Your website, well, your band camp. Well, and I was gonna say, do you want me to do a jingle for your um uh, yeah, that, that would be good. Show. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Oh, so yes, as far as Tiger Moth Tales goes uh you can check us out on Bandcamp. uh there's some stuff on spotify as well uh but yeah the, the best place to go uh and it's brilliant for artists did so much great work um during the lockdown and everything you know with Bandcamp. it was a great thing and that's uh yeah tigermothtales.bandcamp.com and uh yep. thanks everybody out there for your support it means a lot thank you
Yeah, have a good oh. good day. Good afternoon. What's your, what, what's your um what's your uh, radio station called? Is it perfectcitymusic.com? That's the radio station, is it? That's right, perfectcitymusic.com, and then the the YouTube channel is Perfect City Music. As and well. and your name is it's Claudio Bustamante. Yeah. Okay, here we go. Ready? All right. You're listening to Cloud. Oh no, say it. You're listening to Claudio Bustamante on Fairfax City Radio. No, music, isn't it? That's right, yeah. Is it Fairfax City City Music? Music. Okay. Fairfax City Music is fine, yeah. One more time, here we go. You're listening... Okay. Hi, this is Pete Jones from Tiger Moth Tales, and you're listening to Claudio Bustamante on FairfaxCityMusic.com. Great. Thank you very much, Pete. All right, mate. (laughs) Absolutely. I love it. Thank you. All right, good to talk to you, mate. Nice one. Thank you. (laughs) (laughs) You're a funny guy too, man. <laughs> Actually, <laughs>